Art Blakey recorded about 20 albums or so for Blue Note and appeared as a sideman on an additional 40. He could swing like nobody else, but on top of that, his feel and his sense of dynamics brought out the very best in the musicians that he accompanied. Art Blakey's playing kind of demanded that every musician dig in and play to their best. And he was different than other drummers, you know, because he was a heavy swinger. You know, most of the other bebop drummers were kind of light, light playing people, but not him. He was heavy. And he kept his beat and kept the stuff moving at all times. His playing was on such a high level. He's one of the few artists that you could tell that was him immediately when he started playing his instrument. There's only a few artists on that level. Every young cat wanted to come to New York to get a shot, a chance to, to play with the messengers. So all the young bass players, piano players, horn players, they all wanted to come to New York to, to, to become a jazz messenger. And all the drummers wanted to come to New York to absorb everything that, that Art Blakey gave. He gave to humanity and musicians and to the world without asking anything in return. You know, all the musicians that he taught over the years, and all the musicians that he made uh, household names as he turned to jazz, and all the musicians that he trained to understand the foundation of the music and taught that they should write their music and play their music, you know, no matter what age you were, and made your music sound good. <laughs> And basically, when he played, he taught you how to even become a better composer. And he never asked any of us for anything in return. He never asked. He just did it to keep the music alive. I really looked up to him and admired him. And I still admire him. You know, I still uh, recognize him to be the major inspiration and genius that he remains to this day. By January of 1961, Blakey and the Jazz Messengers were big stars all over the world, but they were still kind of stuck in a rut of playing noisy, smoky jazz clubs. That all changed when they arrived in Japan and became among the first American jazz musicians to perform in that country. You know, the thing that, that really, I think, for any Black musician during that time, you know, obviously in the 1960s, we're talking toward 1961, this is right in the middle of the civil rights movement. So... You know, the, to, to go to Japan and to be welcomed at the airport by tons of people. Um, there were uh, stories of photographers, um, news people, crowds of people. Uh, they were playing my dad's music over the, uh, over the intercom at the Tokyo airport. So, you know, a lot of this is really, uh, I would say, unfamiliar to, to, to a Black American, you know, to African American during that time, to have that kind of a reception, you know given the racial tensions back in, in the U.S. So very overwhelming experience. Landing in Japan and all these people of flowers and the, the kimonos and everything, colors all over the place. And the people in Japan wanted to witness something authentic. So we went there knowing that no other jazz beat group has gone. I'm telling you, when we played the first concert, we played maybe at, at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and they lined up at the end. We're signing 2,000 autographs, and it happened everywhere we went. What brought Blakey to Japan, as I understand, was that a Japanese jazz magazine had a poll asking its readers what jazz group they would like to see appear in Japan. And the Jazz Messengers won. And given the timing of record releases, I suspect this had to do with the popularity of the album that Benny Golson had recorded with Blakey that had Monin and Blues March, which were two incredibly tremendous uh, hits as far as jazz recordings went. Bands like Miles Davis, like uh, the Bill Evans Trio later, like the Dave Brubeck Quartet, uh, the Cannonball Adderley Sextet, that would record in Japan and, and be heard there actually followed Art Blakey later in the 60s. So it was quite a, a, a status symbol, I suppose, for the Blakey band to go over there, not as part of a package, but just as featured artists. To say that the Japanese embraced the jazz messengers is a massive understatement. They were greeted with long lines of cheering fans and showered with flowers wherever they went. 
the response of the audiences were overwhelming and it really struck a chord with everyone in the band. The ensuing tour was an emotionally charged affirmation that resulted in some historic concerts and blazed a trail for generations of artists to follow. The shows were incredible, particularly this concert held on January 14th, 1961 at Hibya Public Hall in Tokyo. And now, for the first time, listeners from all over the world are going to be able to fully enjoy a beautiful recording of that show. These are recordings that I first became aware of in 2018, and some associates of mine in Japan made me aware of the existence of these recordings that had never been released before from Art Blakey's first tour of Japan in 1961. Of course, this features the legendary lineup of trumpeter Lee Morgan, tenor saxophonist Wayne Shorter, pianist Bobby Timmons, bassist Jimmy Merritt, and of course, the great Art Blakey. Over the decades, Blue Notes worked closely with Art Blakey's son Takashi and the Blakey estate to preserve his legacy and make sure that his work was readily available. Releasing this recording is a very big deal for all of us, and we really hope you enjoy it. (laughs) 